how do we as a movement understand the impact of image contributions to commons? How do we do it now? How do we need to do it? What's working? What needs improvement? How are we, how are we gonna get there? Um, so I'm Virginia, data products team. The data products focus is on uh, serving data to users. So we are sort of, we are not sort of, we are exactly, precisely the user facing team for data consumption. We're new, we formed in July. So I have to emphasize that this is a new uh, focus um, for the foundation. And the project uh, that I'll be presenting a prototype of today is our very first initiative towards that goal. And I'm gonna pass it to Fiona to just introduce herself. Romeo, I'm in the culture and heritage team at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, and I've been having loads of conversations with people across the movement, including people in this room, about the need for metrics. So that's what we're here to talk about some more today. Excellent. All right. Um, so we, so what we're trying to accomplish in this session is to understand the Wikimedia, that we want you all to understand that the Wikimedia Foundation is working on metrics for commons and that we're starting this work with a primary focus on the GLAM needs. It's a really nicely bounded use case for us to figure out how do we work with the commons data and actually accurately produce metrics for it. Um, we also, a uh, goal is for you to test a very early demo and back. I'll go into that more later. And uh, we also want you to walk away from the session knowing how to continue to provide feedback to us. This is not a once, once you, this is your last chance to work on this with us. This is an ongoing conversation pro process and this is the very first step of it. And then our, and uh, last but not least, Oh, oh, it's got a, the wire is a little broken, I think. Okay, um, so we, uh, so if you are, we will be looking, for data savvy folks, we are going to be looking at data together in spreadsheets and digging into it. For those of you who are data storytellers and less interested in digging into spreadsheets with me, Fiona's here to talk about how to tell stories with data. What are the types of stories you need data to support? and how can we then build the data models that will support those stories. All right, so the agenda, we have 90 minutes minus five, so I don't know, what's that, 85? Okay, so we're gonna start with a couple presentations. First, Fiona, then to give context, and then me to introduce the prototype. Then we'll have our um, breakout workshops. So this is where if you're data savvy, you're going to want to go and dig into the spreadsheets with me. If you're a data storyteller, you're going to want to think um, through emergent uh, data storytelling needs. And then we'll come together as a group and we'll have a brief closing. All right, and with this, I pass it to Fiona. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. Uh, so, what I'm going to be sharing as context to set us up for the workshop, it's not working, is it? Um, oh, it is, okay, is how we understand Commons impact now. Um, and I just wanted to start with like a little bit of a picture of Commons the project and where it is at in its journey. So most of this will be familiar to you. So 2001, Wikipedia began with its first edit. In the same year, Creative Commons was founded. Moving along to 2003, Wikisource launched and the first set of Creative Commons licenses were released. 2004, Wikimedia Commons launches in the same year as Facebook and Flickr and one year before YouTube. The first CC license localizations happen in Brazil, Japan, Germany, and Finland. In 2006, the Commons Picture of the Year Award starts, and there's a beautiful picture of Aurora there, um, which was the winner in that first year. 
Moving along to 2008, one of the very first large contributions to Wikimedia Commons was made by the German National Archives. They shared 80,000 images relating to German history and invited Wikimedians to help identify the people shown in these images by linking to their people authority file because Wikidata didn't exist yet. In the same year, Flickr established their Commons program with the Library of Congress. 2010, Wiki Loves Monuments was piloted in the Netherlands. In 2012, it was certified by the Guinness World Records as the largest photography competition in the world. It surely must still be that, given how it's grown since then. 2011, Creative Commons logo was acquired by MoMA for its collection. Google Arts and Culture was launched by the Google Cultural Institute. 2012, Wikidata launches. The community uh, launches a, a, developed and a community developed and maintained Commons app launches in that year. 2013, Commons passes its first 100 million edits and there's a Commons app for Android and iOS. 2014, it passes 10 million images on Commons. 2017, the Commons Photographers User Group is established and the Sloan Foundation funds a structured data on Commons initiative. 2018, it's possible to upload 3D models in STL format to Commons and one of the first models uploaded was a reconstruction of a statue which was destroyed in 2015. In 2018, it was obviously the last Glam Wiki conference, and at that conference, the Met published and shared its analysis of the reach that they achieved through Wikipedia versus their own website. And this went on to be shared and circulated in museum circles quite a bit. 2019, using structured data on commons and responding to the need for more mobile experiences, the ISA tool was launched. Um, and in 2023, Wikimedia moved to CC 4.0 licenses. And Wikimedia Commons is now the world's largest free to use library of media. And just yesterday, it passed 100 million files. Um. <laughs> So this is, yeah, this is what we're talking about. Because I think sometimes we get like so bogged down in, in the challenges. Like it's just good to step back and kind of remember the journey of this project and how we got to where we are today. Um, and I would love to hear, like that is a potted history of commons, just things that I sort of knew about or could easily find and put together. And I wonder if two or three of you could share a commons milestone that is meaningful to you. That was a big miss. <laughs> what else did you think from that sort of potted history? Cool, so maybe we can pull some of those out. Let me patient hope for one more commons milestone that someone in the room knows about and put on the timeline. Okay, so that's, that's where we are, but 100 million files as of yesterday, which is a huge milestone. Um, so as actually everyone in this room created as a shared repository of freely licensed media for all Wikimedia projects, and the purpose of that was easier to manage copyright information and violations, and for contributors to find and reuse media across different projects and of uh, first one of the first examples of the German archives have contributed millions 
high quality images to comments. Uh, and an analysis found that 50% of the articles that they illustrate are not really related to art at all, but instead cover typical encyclopedia articles on topics like history, religion, geography, broader like play, and actually 88% of the views on art related articles. So in a way, like sometimes I've, not with anyone who's here, at the foundation, Remember the use of photography. So, you know, it's really vital visual information that pops up in all of these really important contexts. And for museums and libraries and archives, that has been really as well because what it does for them is it allows them to present their information their media in different contexts like they're meeting the everyday information needs of people on the internet rather than just speaking to you know a specialist audience of ready museums um, so and so yeah like I said hundred languages that our projects are available in uh, but you know while they're they're often sort of bought into that idea as everyone in this room will know it's really important that they can easily access and share the numbers, the men. Um, to do that, they've typically looked at the utilization of their comments. Are there images? those images been seen by readers um, by, uh, and, and readers you know in different language versions of the projects as well maybe looking at device and operating system to get a sort of proxy for uh, a little bit more information about the users so I had it on the Language. Vast limits to reach can be achieved with contributions to Wikipedia and other Wikimedia projects then through their own channels. In 2021, the Welcome Collection announced a big milestone for them. Wikipedia viewed more than 1.5 billion. That they and I think something that's really special about the kind of reach that Wikipedia can deliver for these institutions is that it isn't necessarily only the large museums with international brands that achieve this visibility. On platforms like social media, you know, the content that is most visible is mostly. But actually, on Wikipedia, if your image is used as the first illustration for an article, you can achieve that vast reach. And it doesn't really matter so much what your non uh, Just a few hundred image files that were contributed by the Museum of Veterinary Anatomy in Sao Paulo, Brazil millions of them. 
Americans also are starting to think quite a lot. They know, hopefully, achieve this reach and views on the Wikimedia projects, but they're also starting that their content moves through these Wikimedia platforms to meet those everyday information needs of people who are using search engines or voice assistants and now, you know, AI chatbots and show they're sort of showing how, you know, the data Base gets put out on their rights, but can be contributed to Wikimedia projects, and through that, and especially, you know, so. And images has reached global, you know, as the benefit, but actually a lot of the institutions do it for reasons that go beyond the impact of that um, the thing that they talked about was that some of the most viewed images attributed to Wikipedia are of women of colour, such as Sojourner Truth, a Chippeway Widow, and Joseph. So for them, that really, it showed that they were realising that goal of uh, addressing representation gaps on the internet. Um, and, you know, if you are coming with something the size of your that's when you work projects. Similarly, uh, Wikimedia UK Lily collection By focusing on those gaps, they are getting big numbers that, you know, are motivating. Of investment. So, you know, this article we contributed to has been assessed by the community as a good article. You know, this image has been marked as featured image and you know that is an important signal to them alongside just you know the overall numbers I know that other affiliates like Wikimedia Italia and Wikimovimento Brazil in other contexts are also looking at the quality of contributions that are generated by their quantity of content or you know volume of views but actually you know what is the quality how are we improving quality on the projects with what we do so that's that's the good bit <laughs> that I get to share. And you know, I also know that there are a number of challenges with how all of this works right now. And you know, like I said, we've been having these conversations for the last eighteen months. You know, very active. This is like an attempt. Sweden, the Wikimedians in Residence Support Network, the European Glam Coordinators, on the Global Glam Wiki mailing list and Telegram channels, and on a community developed page of Glam Metrics Needs, which I know some of you in the room. So some of the things we've heard, like a lot. First, when all of the tools broke, obviously that was the crisis, and that's know that perhaps in data 
actually those numbers are getting, you know, passes or accounting issues with some of the tools and which means if an article is on like a, a main page for we maybe count the numbers. So people like we share numbers because it's all we have. Like it's the best evidence we have to give to partners. Hundred percent reliable. The other, you know, obvious issue is that community, the commonly used tools are not maintained uh, reliably and can fail, and that damages the credibility of our projects and our. Share their plan, like feed into the annual planning process, get budget to continue their process, and they couldn't get the numbers. And so, actually, you know, that, that program was actually for this fiscal year because they weren't available. So, that had a really big impact. Uh, we also hear that the partners that uh, communities are working with don't understand the diverse tools, workflow. What is this number really showing me? How is it calculated? And so what that means is that there's a lot of extra work that the volunteers, the Wikimedians in residence, the affiliates and other groups have to do, like translating all of that. And it means that there isn't like a self-service model where partners can retrieve and explore the data directly and in, in an ongoing basis. And some of that really rich analysis that we see people out, only an example I shared, that's only possible if the special staff with access explore, uh, pulling out those insights themselves. We haven't standardized our definitions and methods. Uh, we all use slightly different recipes, different tools, we're, we're processing data in different And what I have is Europe, it's making it really difficult. And we don't want to compare like in the sense of League table, who's doing best, but to sort of understand working, moving the numbers. And if you don't quite know what you're looking at with the numbers and what the numbers are telling you, you don't quite trust them, it's hard to learning from the numbers. Um, other sort of, this is more like things we also wish we had, but they, they are challenges. We have no insight really into off-wiki usage of images. We don't really have qualitative studies or available like that. And nor do we even have a kind of download. There isn't like a reliable proxy for off-wiki usage. Um, we're hearing like we've had some really enthusiastic adopters of structured data. I'm looking at you, Dominic, among others. What they're seeing, but they actually want to see some evidence or signal of what impact those contributions are having. And then increasingly, we're hearing people talking about wanting to track the retention of contributors over time. So, you know, this is particularly relevant, I think, for Wiki Loves campaigns that focus more on contributors. Initially, there was a big focus on new contributors. Increasingly, people are interested in, are we reactivating them each year? If we bring someone in through this one club competition, do we then find them contributing to other competitions? So these are the main themes I've heard so far. Um, again, I'm gonna break here really briefly to hear, I mean, I know there are like, thousands of things we could talk about, but is there a big sort of headline category of challenges that I haven't um, highlighted here? I guess one thing is there's no dashboard, there's no obvious place that you can just go and find all the information about your project, your individual uploads, your uploads. There's no way to go and do that. You really have to know where to look to find these metrics if they're available. Yeah, and that's sort of, I mean, that's the challenge of visualization analysis step is where we've seen a lot of people like trying to build tools and I think 
that is a, an important part of that self-service model. Like people, you know, not everyone wants to dig into the raw data or a spreadsheet and, you know, they want those more accessible uh, ways of, of seeing the information. Thanks for that. Dominic. Um, well, something you're seeing kind of implied here, but also uh, the problem is growing the more larger and larger data sets we're dealing with over time. And that's particularly with cultural institutions. So there's some urgency there, I guess. I was celebrating growth, like growth of images, growth of structured data, but yeah, like we sort of need to fix some things. Um, before we just keep going, maybe, yeah. Um, I, I'm sorry. Um, I think uh, um, a bit in, in uh, what has been said, uh, in my experience, more, most of the tools available are in some way half cooked. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe the worst is um, see not to have a permanent staff maintaining it. Uh, maybe I'm maintaining as a, a system, system administrator, the, the operation, which is fine. But no, maybe not with the with the um, keeping the 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 development of the application alive. There are other cases. Uh, for example, I adore adore really adore and fans. I don't know if, if he's here. Magnus Magnus Manzi tools are amazing. But we have a dependency of him. I think uh, he's not on the staff uh, for any chapter. And we are in a very delicate situation depending on the availability of free time of a very, very important person. Yes. And I think in, in most of the organization, important organization, can have this risk. And again, I love his work. Mm -hmm. He asked what to do. Yes, come back and I just wanted to say that there's a lot of There's not really any way I, that I know of that we can ever track off what you use. Well, downloads. Yeah. Accurate kind of downloads would be. I don't know. You're an engineer. Let's figure it out there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's possible. It's not. Yeah, okay. But we could want things to Never say never over.
against very empirical uh, uh, assessment that um, quite often the tech teams don't really know how to address these issues because these are also quite neat. Th thanks for that. I just want to say 100%. No one needs to. No one wants to have another conversation with me, empathising about metrics. <laughs> so you know that's why I'm here with my friends from the product and technology department to you know get that better understanding and actually talk about what we can do. Um, so just like yeah, a little bit of context. Obviously, everyone in the room agrees this is important, um, but we actually have clear signals from the movement strategy that this is something that we need to be working on. So we think this work really fits. Um, it's an essential support for like knowledge as a service, having allowing institutions to use our projects to disseminate their knowledge. Um, and it's also very clearly in the movement strategy recommendation around evaluate, iterate and adapt. You know, if we're going to evaluate and be a learning organization, a learning movement, we need to really understand what we're doing and the impact it's having was also clearly signaled in our annual plan. So in the product and technology plan, there was a signals and data services bucket, uh, which was quite high level, but in the culture and heritage section of the annual plan, which was like within equity, a few levels down, we clearly stated that we would have this collaboration with product around commons impact metrics. So uh, now I'm handing the mic to my product colleague, Virginia. And let's change seats as well. Okay, so Fiona did an amazing job of uh, celebrating the amazing community work that's gone into this over the years, and also outlining all of the challenges that we have ahead. So I'm here um, with some hopefully good news um, that we're trying to address. Okay with a prototype of our Commons Impact Metrics data product. And I will tell you a little bit more about that now. So um, when we were looking at all of these historic challenges around metrics, as a, pro as a data product team, we thought, what kind of value can we provide this massive, beautiful movement? Um, what's missing that we can actually provide? We can't do everything, but what can we do? So our value proposition is that we can create a centralized, pre-computed data set that will increase reliability and trust in the data used to demonstrate impact of media available on commons and enable the movement to evaluate, iterate, and adapt. It's just a hypothesis. Or, sorry, no, this is a value proposition. This is the value that we do. Sorry, I'm going to get to the hypothesis in a minute. But this is, you know, we're, this is the value that we think we can generate as a, as a data products team. We can't fix all the tools. We can't, do, we can't do everything, but we can provide the underlying data set. Okay, so I want to ask you all, since a big topic is that the data is not that reliable. It's not that trustworthy. So I just want to know from you, what is trustworthy data? What makes data trustworthy? <laughs> the base, at the base level. This, this, the, it stays the same when you query twice. Um, so it stays the same. What else makes data trustworthy? Reliable source. So that's like provenance. You know where the data comes from. Yeah. Yeah. documentation so you know what the data is and how to work with it and what it's designed to do. Uh, I mean, related to it saying the same, if there are uh, errors that are messy and you can maybe go back and fix them if uh, you have the data available or at least that it's clear to you or what happens to work with that. 
error messages that are usable and functional and you can that are informative as opposed to just a blocker or a dead end. Cool. Anything else? Yeah. One other thing I would say is like uh, they're they can be this the meaning can be described because we have all these different terms, views, requests, like what uh, if we're using these with partners there needs to be like an assignable meaning of what, what it is we're and um, mean, meaning like the sort of story on top of the data or the what it signals? Definitions. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. What does that actually mean? How is that, how are those numbers generated? How is it calculated? What is, what do we mean by a request? Is a request like, I, you know, I don't, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but is it, is a request like a page view or is it a media download or, a, you know? Yeah, yeah. So really clear definitions, and that include what it's not, what it is, or what you're working with. OK. Um, this metaphor that I'm working on, um, and I'm workshopping it live with you, so feedback is welcomed. So a lot of our current tools actually work with really raw data, um, which is why there's discrepancies. So, um, when you're working with raw data, and I'll talk about this, I'll get more, I have a diagram that I'll talk to about it more, but um, raw data is amazing and it's designed to capture everything, but it's not actually designed to be explicit. So you have to create meaning through data modeling. So if you are working with uh, raw data versus cooked data, um, like raw data is amazing. You can hand make a cake with your, like you can get all of the bits and all of the ingredients that you need for your cake and it's gonna be, a, it, it's gonna be really interesting and great. Or it could be a failure if you like got the portions wrong, you know? You, and you, know, you don't really know if it's gonna be an amazing cake or a failure. But then, you know, luckily there's, um, you know, prepackaged cake mixes can come in really handy if you need to make a lot of cakes and you need it at scale make sure it's reliable or you don't have time or you know the stakes are high you need something that's proven that will work that is delicious okay so thanks for going with me and it's delicious data okay so um i skipped ahead a little bit but the centralized logic is if it's raw the the logic is there isn't really logic it's not there isn't centralized logic so in a in a cooked data set you can get centralized data you can reduce the complexity required to create a query through raw data. Um, um, and we, it also makes it easy to serve it via APIs and data dumps that are like not gigantic or like overly complex and hard to navigate. So fit for purpose APIs and data dumps. Uh, you can also mitigate all these calculation discrepancies that are unclear or vague. Um, we can scale our ability to solve issues. So like Dominic brought up the error messages, an error comes up, we can act, there's a central place in which to go and figure out what's going on and how, how can we solve it. Um, and we can also set service level objectives, which means we can reliably say the data will be there and here's our contract with you. We are, and here's how we're going to maintain the system so that it is available when you need it. And that the documentation, I put discoverability, so like, where is it? Is it in a centralized place or is it all over the wikis? How do you find it? Um, but also accessible documentation. A lot of our documentation is incredible, but it's not very accessible. Um, so if you are a new engineer or you're a product manager that doesn't want to get into the weeds, you just want some high-level information about what the, what the data does. Um, so this is another value add. So it's like, you know, on the back of the box, it says put an egg in some milk and, make, and put it in the oven. It's like very clear the instructions that you need to do to make the cake or the delicious data. All right. So that is what we're hoping we're going to be able to do.
but there are, it does, it's not without challenges. And the first challenge that we have to face in order to make this delicious data is we need to figure out how we're gonna work with categories. And this is really at the heart of how, what we, we need to learn from the movement. How does the movement use categories? How should we um, calculate using categories? And what's amazing is that you can use categories in any way that you want on, these, on Wikimedia Commons. There are guidelines, but you don't have to follow them. This is amazing for users, but very hard for us trying to make sense of the data. Yes? to be the mood, destroy it, and substitute it with a stupid data commons that I You guys all need to agree that among yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> let us know. Let us know. We'll be that with you. You're right. Okay, so now I'll talk a little bit sorry, about the SEMA. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. 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 Actually, from my perception, I find them very intuitive and very useful, especially for people who are not from a tech background. Mm -hmm. The only challenge is that sometimes we find two categories for the same thing with uh, different spelling or something. So it like, it's like uh, <coughs> not, not making our efforts visible. If we have 100 photos about Montevideo and they are in two separate categories, we would not really understand how many images we have on comments. So you are agreeing with me? No, I love them. No, yeah, you're you agreeing. Yeah. <laughs> when you're talking about, it's a question about interface, <laughs> and this is to be solved with a structural system. Actually, what I love is on Wikimedia Commons, they are visually very intuitive and. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Breakout. Okay, just to illustrate what I'm talking about when I say raw data and what makes it complex, you have to go across different, it's, it's non-trivial calculations are required. The data model doesn't prevent cycles, meaning like duplications, um, and the data's really huge. It's too big. It's like using a, it's like using a like a hammer to cut your steak or something. It's just not, it's the wrong, it's the wrong tool for the job that you're trying to do. So what we have, uh, what, so we have our, now comes the, uh, hi, the hypothesis. For this prototype, we think that if we have a standard framework for the computation of the category tree, we can define a simplified data model to calculate metrics in order to provide a trustworthy pre-calculated data set that meets the movement's need for commons um, so I specified utilization metrics because while we want to think about the future, and, and Fiona is going to do this, in order to deliver value, we have to bound the scope so that we have a place to start. So I don't want us to get too excited. Um, uh, we're really focused here on utilization metrics, and you'll see more about what that is. Um, so with our category tree that we are proposing that we'll be looking at together is... Um, it makes it easy to navigate. It's, the lines are, fairly, are, are pretty you know, straight, <laughs> hopefully. And um, the cycles can be filtered out and the data can be you know, really fit in terms of size, fit for purpose. All right, so we're from complexity to hopefully simplicity. Um, the prototype, it consists of five data sets designed to support most of the use cases in the existing GLAM tools. This is where we are starting. We want to improve your current experience. Um, so there's a, the prototype is Google Sheets. It's easy and accessible. It's queryable. You can add visualizations to it. And uh, each data set has a query, queryable Google Sheet for it. But um, so you can't query across the data sets in the prototype, but in the, eventually uh, the, you will be able to. We just didn't have an accessible tool in which we could build the prototype to do that. All right, um, so here's what it looks like when I say a data prototype. It is literally spreadsheets. And um, there I've outlined a, taste, a testing process that we will, in my group, go through together. And um, I, after you look at it, I'm going to have a few questions. I want to know how you feel about our approach to the category tree. I'm going to also want to know what questions are you able to answer with these data sets? And are there any questions or use cases that we've totally missed? Um, and 
how might we leverage Commons Impacts Metrics data as a product, as an API or a dump to support the existing tools? What would be required to do so? How do we help support, how can this help support the existing tools? All right, so I'll skip that because I'll give that to you later. Um, Fiona, this is you. And then we're gonna break out, right? Okay. So if you don't feel like ready and willing to work with spreadsheets this afternoon, um, or if you do that for a bit and you're like, okay, that, that's, that's me done, um, we can have a really inspiring, future-looking conversation about what other things we would want. I just wanna be really, really clear that this is a conversation with Fiona, not a conversation with product and tech. And you know, there will be a whole process for deciding how any of these things would be prioritized. So, you know, as Virginia said, what will be done this year is very tightly scoped on delivering the data that's already available in the commonly used tools. So Magnus's tools, uh, Glamwiki dashboard, Cassandra, that's kind of what we're seeking to uh, support. But I've been hearing some other potential metrics that, you know, things have changed. The, the things that GLAMs care about have changed. The things that we as a movement care about have changed. And maybe the metrics that we have right now are answering, you know, qu the only questions we had 10 years ago, and we have some new questions now. So some of the ones I've heard about um, are, Accurate count of downloads, okay, Cormac, you know, like I said, we're not saying it's possible, <laughs> but we have heard repeatedly that, you know, people would want something that gives them more insight into this. Um, you know, as we've started developing things uh, at the foundation, like the suggested images tool, where, you know, we'll suggest an image for an un unillustrated article, people have started to say, like, I'd really love to know which of the images I've contributed have gone on to be the first image to illustrate an article because that tells me that I'm filling a knowledge gap and that would be a really important thing to be able to share. That's kind of what the Smithsonian did manually. Um, you know, also people would like to know, am I providing images that are helping to illustrate underrepresented topics? And, you know, the research team at the foundation has been producing um, an analysis of underrepresented topics by things like gender, geography. Um, so wouldn't it be great if you didn't just see like the projects, the articles, the numbers, but you had a sense of, yeah, your content is actually having an impact on these underrepresented topics. Um, like we saw with Wikimedia UK um, and the Kalili collection, you know, how many of your images that you've contributed have quality assessments? Like the community have told you, this is good, this is valuable, um, and wouldn't it be great to surface that kind of information? Negative signals. Are you generating a lot of deletion requests and problems for the community? I think we would wanna surface that back to partners um, so that they can kind of reflect on their approach. Um, and then I've also heard people want to understand, particularly the people who are contributing structured data, um, how many of my images are being discovered through media search or image suggestions, you know, because of the, the great way that I've modeled that data. So these are some of the, the new questions I've been hearing that we can't possibly, like we can't currently answer in an easy way. And I'm not promising we will, but if you don't, you know, yeah, we can have a chat about it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, it's time to collaborate. How are we gonna do this? Um, if, I'm gonna, I have a, the QR code, but I thought it might be sort of nice if we congregate in areas based on what you wanna work on. No pressure, but if you do, I'm gonna move over to that side of the room um, with my laptop and um, help people through the instructions of working with the prototype. And I think Fiona's gonna stay on this side of the room and facilitate conversation and take notes in terms of the, um, the new questions. So let's just take a few minutes. It's, um, this session ends at 3.30, which means we have how much time left? Sorry? We have 50 minutes, this is amazing! Okay, good, I thought we were talking forever. I'm so glad we have time together, okay. 
So we'll split off, and then um, in the last 10 minutes or so, we'll uh, re- Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, the Cassandra tool fits into that category of uh, tools that were important to the community and used by a lot of partners that haven't been able to be uh, reliably maintained or, or scaled or made available to everyone. Um, but definitely when the product team did their analysis of data needs, that was one of the products that they looked at. So when they were sort of determining what are the... Um, what are the use cases? They looked at Cassandra Glam Wiki dish dashboard, which was the evolution by Wikimedia Israel, and also all of the kind of Magnus tools. So um, unfortunately, Wikimedia Switzerland hasn't been able to maintain and, and scale that. Um, and we've been talking to them, like we've had conversations with um, tool makers or tool providers who would potentially be impacted by this about, you know, we don't, if, an affiliate has a tool like that that they want to sustain into the future, then we want to support them to migrate, you know, start using the new data sets, the more reliable, the shared definitions, all of that, but not necessarily like, you know, end those dashboards. But at the moment, they haven't been able to um, scale or, or, or maintain that reliably. All right, so let's uh, get our blood flowing. Um, even if you're not moving, maybe stand up for a minute. This, I, I have been sitting so much at this conference that I feel um, like I really need it. And it's hot. I'm opening this window, and if others are near windows, please open them. 